species <coughs> community has changed in exceptional ways. Let's see, where is the pointer? This must be the pointer. Yeah. Here it is. <coughs> the objective is to compare two surveys. Ecologists and geneticists often want to compare observations at several sites that have <coughs> been repeated, the observations, at two different times that I will call T1 and T2 in this talk. <coughs> in landscape ecology and genetics, the data are community composition or population gene frequencies observed at different sites and different times. The community composition data that we have examined uh, <coughs> Uh, and that we have experimented with are from the terrestrial and marine ecosystems <clears throat> and we can refer to the variation in community composition across time as temporal beta diversity. The general question of interest is the following. In what ways do the observations at individual sites on the map differ between surveys at time one and time two? This is the question that I will be addressing here. And then two particular sub-questions are of interest. Are there sites where the changes between T1 and T2 are exceptional in community composition? And how do the species losses and gains from T1 to T2 compare among the sites? When comparing two surveys of a site at times one and two, the relevant information is actually found in the two community composition vectors containing species, presence, absence, or abundance data. It would not be useful to compare species richness, for instance, may be equal <coughs> at the two times, yet there may have been important changes between T1 and T2. These vectors, however, contain too much information to be easy to grasp, and ecologists often crunch that information into a dissimilarity index computed for the two vectors, times one and times two. <clears throat> the method I'm going to describe has two parts. The first one is to estimate the change at each site between time one and time two, using an appropriate dissimilarity index, and then test the significance of that change. And the second part is to find ways of partitioning the dissimilarity information into finer indices of losses and gains of species which may tell us something about the processes at work in the system. I will show now how we can compute an index from presence absence data at a site. This uh, schematic summarizes the comparison of the survey at time one and at time two for a site. So in this uh, picture, at the two times we have five species in common, the squares represent species. So this would be the similarity portion, and indeed in the <coughs> equations for indices of uh, the similarity for presence absence data, the, and this portion is called A. B is the number of species that pr were present at time one but have been lost, and C is the number of species that have been gained between time one and time two. And these two parts here, this plus that, is combined in this similarity indices to form the numerator of the dissimilarity. So these are the two usual coefficients that we use the most often, with B plus C, the dissimilarity in the denominator, and here we, in the numerator, sorry, and here in the de denominator we have A plus B plus C, whereas here in this coefficient, in the denominator, we have the total A plus B plus the total here, B plus C. So two times A plus B plus C. You know these coefficients, they have been used. Jacquard coefficient has been used since the year uh, uh, 1900. And the B and C statistics in the numerator of these indices, they actually decompose the presence absence data into losses of species, the B, those that have been lost and the gains of species, the species that have been gained. And we will see more of that in a moment. Similarly, constructed indices can be used to measure changes in abundance per species at a site. I'll not work, walk you through the calculation uh, in the same way, but essentially, <coughs> these indices are constructed in the same way as the previous ones, 
except that we, I'm using large letters here, with B and C being the abundances per species, sum over all species, a loss and gain. This is the dissimilarity portion, and that's the, the denominator. And for the other coefficient, the percentage difference, it is the same numerator, but with a different denominator. So these, again, are usual indices. And again, B, the BNC statistics in the numerator of these indices, they decompose abundance data into species losses and gains. Now, what will we do with that? We will use these indices as temporal beta diversity indices. But what we will do is, if this is the data matrix for sites by species at time one, and then the same sites by the same species at time two, we will simply compare this vector to that vector for site one at times one and two and compute the dissimilarity. Then we repeat that for site two, this vector compared to that, we compute the dissimilarity. And so on for each pair of vectors, we compute a dissimilarity and we end up with a, a single vector of dissimilarities uh, that has one value for each site. Okay? So it is very different from what we usually do in that analysis where we compute the similarities among all the sites. We don't do that here. A further question then, are there sites where the differences are so important, where these D values are so important, that they do not seem to belong to the same statistical population as the others? I've developed a test of significance to answer that question, but in the interest of time, I will skip that, and you can look at it on the manuscript. Uh, <coughs> submitted manuscript, which is already available on my web page if you are interested. I'm going to go directly to an example. Well, it is not a marine example. I chose that example because I have, uh, <coughs> this example is useful to show the uh, temporal di beta diversity indices and also interesting things that we can do with the B and C portions of these indices. But then we can apply this uh, method uh, also to <coughs> marine data, of course. So this is the famous Barrow Colorado Island, uh, Island Dynamic Forest Plot in Panama. It is on an island in the Panama Canal uh, in a lake called Gatun Lake. And uh, this uh, forest plot has been studied since 1980 by a group of researchers uh, from the Smithsonian Tropical. This is a habitat map, and the data for that have been published in 2001 by these authors, showing the six, uh, the six main groups of habitat in that forest. And here the forest is divided into squares, quadrats, of 20 by 20 meters. And uh, here I simply redo, re redrew the map from the original data using R so that it looks better. And we are going to focus on this group here, which is also known as the swamp. This is a, s a section of the, of the forest where water accumulates during the rainy season, and that has a different vegetation from everything else. But then we will see that something is happening in that swamp area, and we will compare its vegetation to that of the surrounding group one, which is called forest. This is a uh, <coughs> uh, zoom in on the swamp area. And uh, there are 30 of these quadrats in the swamp area. And here I have put in gold color the squares where gains are larger than losses in abundances per species. So most of the, of the quadrats in the swamp are in that condition. Let's see, give the explanation. Then uh, with red rims, I have the squares that are uh, very strongly significant, even, even after a correction for <coughs> multiple testing. And in green, two, two squares that were significant at the 0.05 level, but not uh, after correction for multiple testing. So we can see that there seems to have been mostly gains of species in that swamp. Uh, and, and this is between the 1985 survey and the two 2015 a survey. <clears throat> so there are 30 years in between the two surveys. So it's interesting to wonder uh, what is going on there. Oh, by the way, the size of the bubbles, the size of the circle, is proportional to the TBI value, so to the dissimilarity index. 
As an example, I will then analyze in detail the changes in the swamp and the R function that does the calculation, I call the TBI, and I input the data, the community composition data for the second survey in 1985, and here the community composition data for the eighth survey, 2015, and I will do the analysis for the 30 sites that are members of group four, the swamp. So one piece of output is this table here, where for each site, we measure the B component, that is the losses of species. Here is the C component, the gains of species. This plus that is equal to the dissimilarity, because every one of these components has the denominator. And here the, the function tells us that there, is, there has been a loss of abundances per species for that site. Now, quadrat number two, here is the B, here is the C, and C, and we see now that C is larger than B, so there's a plus sign. <coughs> and for most of the quadrats in the, in the swamp, we had plus signs, uh, meaning that there have been gains of abundances per species. The function then displays a summary, which is like this, where we have the mean value of losses and mean value of uh, gains then is the denominator of the specific function that we are using. The mean dissimilarity, this plus that equals that. And then we have here how much is B o divided by B plus C. So what is the contribution of losses over the dissimilarity portion? What is the contribution of gain? So the change is uh, strongly positive for these sites of the swamp. There is also a, a test of significance, which is actually a pair T test of the B and C vectors uh, computed here with the P values coming out. Okay, so the results indicate that uh, for the swamp, there has been a significant gain of species abundances between the two surveys. The function also produces the indices for each of the 30 sites, the P values and the adjusted P values. Now there is something else that we can do with these B and C components, and it is to look at them more closely in graphs like this. Here in the abscissa, I put the species losses, and here in the ordinate, I put, I put the species gains. Here I have included all 1,250 quadrats of the BCI forest. The colors are the same as, the, as on the habitat map, but by and large, we don't see the details of what's going on because there are too many points. Here, I included the diagonal line, the green line, that goes through the origin and separates the points where losses dominate from the points where gains dominate. Now, there is a red line also, and this is what is explained in this uh, text. The, the red line passes through the center of mass of all these points and is parallel to the green. So because the red line is underneath, is, uh, let's say, <clears throat> to, to the right of the green line, it indicates that overall in the BCI plot, losses have dominated. Now, since we don't see much of what is going on there, I had the idea of redoing these graphs for each of the six habitat groups separately. For instance, in habitat group one, the gold uh, <coughs> squares on the habitat map, and this is the region surrounding the swamp. So we have the red line underneath the green, meaning losses of uh, individuals per species. Same thing in habitat two, three, five, and six. The red line is always underneath the green. Here, the red line is above the green, and this is the swamp area. Uh, here, the size of the symbols is proportional to the TBI index. So we can see that the swamp area is where something special has happened. And yes, so uh, going back to the literature, we learned that the period from 1982 to 1992 included several extremely dry seasons. And, but since then, there have been few such drought events high tree growth rates and death rates uh, were observed during the drought period, but not since then. And this is in a paper by Rick Condit, who is one of the PIs of the BCI forest. 
So uh, <clears throat> it seems that the swamp is shrinking to, due to species invasions from group one around it. And this is, was made possible because, because the swamp has become drier, allowing the species from the area around it to invade the swamp. <coughs> There's a more detailed analysis of this sentence in the paper, but I'm skipping that today. Uh, to come to a sort of uh, summary, from this detailed analysis of the B and C components, what did we learn? It, this analysis brings us to the heart of the mechanisms by which communities change through time, that is losses and gains of species, or losses and gains of individuals of the various species. Okay. Uh, we can do the same BC plots with presence, absence, or with abundance data. BC analysis is especially interesting in species-rich communities, and everyone here who is working in tropical or subtropical areas uh, has such species-rich data, because we cannot examine the changes in each species individually. Uh, it can also apply, and this is very interesting, to subgroups of sites, as I've shown for the BCI data, or for specific groups of species that are known to react differently to environmental stressors, for instance, in trees, different size classes, or species of different origins. So you can split them and do these analysis separately. With this talk, I'm hoping to encourage <coughs> you marine ecologists to try this type of analysis, because new ideas of how to use these results will emerge as ecologists experiment with this method on different systems. As a last slide, I'm just showing you four <coughs> papers that have been published already, or one is uh, uh, submitted, where we have applied this method to marine data, bracket data, freshwater data, and freshwater data here. So it can be applied to lots of different uh, types of communities, and we have more such studies in progress. Thank you for your attention.